Let's have, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the messages in the scripture. And we pray, Lord, that um, as we open up and consider your word, that you will lead us and guide us as to what you would have us to do and how we may impact our homes, our communities, and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you grew up as a part of the TV generation? See some hands there, a lot of hands there. So I had a um, particular show that I loved. Not the Tom Cruise version, but the original Mission Impossible. The IMF, Impossible Missions Force. Started out at reel to reel. For those of you who weren't born back in our day, there was something called a reel to reel, little tape on either side of these round disc roundup. And for those of us who were, who were really good at technology, like Barney, we could put that, you know, put, take a piece of tape, scotch tape, put it together. For those of you, I know, I see a lot of faces, no idea what I'm talking about. But for those of you who've had like things like eight tracks, you know what I'm saying. I wanted to be a member of the IMF. I wanted to go out and, you know, the rest of the family, you know, they're watching whatever, Bonanza, all these things. But there were two shows that our families would get together for. The first one was Peyton Place. Needless to say, I was excused for watching Peyton Place. I wanted to, try to peek in from that, that didn't work out too well. But Mission Impossible, I was there, and there was a condition for being there. I had to be quiet. Now, for those of you who know me, you know that's a bit of a problem sometimes, but I, I tried, I tried. And one of the reasons why Mission Impossible was so fascinating, my family loved it so much, because there was a person on the show that looked like us, Barney. So Barney was our favorite. And there was one episode where Barney gets shot and my aunt almost fainted. I mean, she screamed, she fell, as like, how could this possibly happen? Barney survived and thankfully so did my aunt. But I would imagine myself as Jim, the, the head of the impossible missions force out on my bike, other kids were doing whatever. And I'd go maybe look in a, um, look at a bird's nest to see if there was a tape in there. Maybe there's a message for me. And there might be, you know, I'd imagine there was, you know, a couple of cracked eggs. There's something. I'm, you know, the birds are attacking me. I'm attacking the birds. And there'd be a, a secret message. And, you know, they always start off with your, your message, your goal, if you choose, your mission, if you choose to accept it. And you know, I've never seen an episode where they said, nah, I think we're just gonna hang out today. We're gonna go to Chuck E. Cheese and spend our time there. They, whoever can just deal with it themselves. But Impossible Missions Force always steps up to the plate. And it's interesting, you know, as you watch shows like that, you never take into consideration all the mundane things they have to do, you know, get their, get their tickets for their flights, all the research they have to do, the traffic, you know, getting sick, oh, I'm sorry, I can't make it today because I, you know, I have a cold or the flu, all these things, it's just always on, always on. And so as I'm, I'm reading in Revelation, and Anna was just reading. It's very interesting. If you'd please turn to Revelation chapter 7. And John is talking about a lot of things because he has been shown a lot of things. And he says in the beginning of, of chapter 7, it says, After those things that I was shown, I saw four angels 
standing at the four corners of the earth. And that's interesting because earth is round, but in God's eyes, he can do whatever he wants with geometry and geography. Amen. So four corners of the earth holding the four winds, holding the four ends, winds so that the wind should not blow, not on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And then there's this fifth angel, this fifth entity, ascending from the east. And this fifth angel has something significant. The seal of the living God. And this fifth angel cries out with a loud voice to the four angels that, please note their allowance, that they were allowed to harm the earth and the sea. And this fifth angel says, don't do it. Don't harm the earth, the sea, or even the trees until we've sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Don't harm the earth until the sealing has been complete. But then after that, I don't know. I don't know. After that, there are some challenges. So you say not until we're done. And, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now. And it's so easy to get caught up in the details. And I'm a person that gets caught up in the details. It's easy to get caught up in the details. And it's easy to lose sight of the bigger issue. The bigger issue is really there are two sides. That's all. There's two sides. There's this enemy who has titles such as accuser of the brethren. Another title, father of lies. So originator of lies. John 8, 44 says he was a murderer from the beginning. And that's interesting because, you know, our Bible starts off with in the beginning, God. But yet at the beginning, there was also a murderer in heaven. And we saw his murderous acts when he put our Savior on a cross. A murderer from the beginning. Also, another title which is interesting that he gets a title of a, of a fictional entity, a dragon. Now, the only dragons I know are dragonflies. I find them fascinating, but I'm not intimidated by a dragonfly. This is the dragon of your worst dreams, also known as the serpent of old. And then, unfortunately, in Revelation 12, 9, known as the deceiver of the whole world. You know what a deceiver does? A deceiver is, how, how many of you like magic? Illusionists. You're watching a hand over here, they're doing all this stuff, but they're really doing something over here. That's what this enemy is doing today to so many people, having, having us look at, at people, at places, saying, that's right, that's wrong, when he's making it wrong for everyone. Because every single person that dies, their probation is closed. There's no more, no more opportunity to get the message. No more opportunity to hear of a loving Savior who died for them so they don't have to kill for a cause. Their probation over. And that deceiver of the whole world would like that 
to happen to each one of us. That's one side. The other side, again, we're talking about mission impossible. Unfortunately, if someone is known as the deceiver of the whole world, it is impossible to stop that person from their mission. It is impossible for you and I to stop someone who was a murderer from the beginning. You and I can't do it. But there's another side. Thankfully, we are not hopeless, helpless victims. We have the, not a, the Savior. We have the Son of God. And he also undertook an impossible mission. That was to save us. All the stuff that we've done, all the stuff that we do, he still chose us. And he gives us another impossible mission, and that is to choose somebody else to invite somebody else along. Because as this, as the, as the four angels are holding those four winds, I would imagine that some of us may wonder, how much longer? Is it possible that some of those angels may be losing their grip? And how does that affect you and how does that affect me? One of the verses that you probably hear a lot of, see a lot of, is out of the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 4. And it talks about people running to and fro, and the context is running to and fro in the book of Daniel, searching for answers. And, and Daniel is told, knowledge will increase. So the more you and I read, the more you and I study, the more you and I search, we will get more knowledge. And that's what we want. That's what we need. Because there's another verse, Joel 3.14, one of my favorite verses. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And the Lord is telling us it's time to get out of the valley, make a decision, and get to a side. And the only way you can get to a side is by studying, searching, increasing your knowledge of both sides so that you know which side will sustain you. Because unfortunately, what we see in the world comes out of Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 14. It says, they have healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You hear a lot of people talking about peace. Next year, we'll be voting for either the same president or a different president, and a lot of us are looking for peace. We want peace in our homes, peace in our community, peace with our jobs, peace with our finances. We want world peace. We want an individual who can bring that to reality. And the Lord says that is healing our hurt slightly. Just, just a little bit, but not enough because there is no peace in this world. And if we are looking for peace in this world, we're going to be disappointed every time. I would also like you to look at, as you are studying, later at your opportunity to look at Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 because 
there are many people who are putting off studying, seeking, searching until a more convenient, opportune time. And this verse should give us a lot of concern. Amos 8, 11, and 12 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God. So this is a quote from God himself, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, or, or nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. That's a scary time. That's a time, a famine that I want no part of that I cannot imagine what it would be like to be searching for something that is not findable. So now, as we have time, God offers a full buffet because Revelation 7 and those angels, the seal of God is settling into the truth. It's getting that knowledge, but it's more than getting knowledge. It's knowing what to do with it. It is making the decision that no matter what, you are not changing. No, like, those, like those three Hebrew young men who said to Nebuchadnezzar, I don't care, toss us in the fiery furnace, don't toss us in the fiery furnace, we're not changing. And each of us are going to be tested to make sure that there's nothing that can separate you from the Savior. His hand is always out until he says, Everyone who has wanted to make a decision has made one. But there are still going to be multitudes in the valley of decision, and the time will have passed. And that is not something that I would want for myself, for my family, for any of you. We have this opportunity not just not just in our church as individuals, but as our church as a family. So as, as you're hearing talk of, of plans for the next two years, some of you will choose to be church officers, some of you will choose not to be. But what matters is what you choose to do for the Lord. Whether you're an officer in a position or not, you have to decide what you're going to do for God. And if where you are is good enough to get you through a time of trouble, like Daniel 12.1 says, a time of trouble such as never been seen on this earth. So for all the things, all the news that you may be watching, the worst is yet to come. Are you ready? And if not, why not? We are blessed with the Sabbath for a lot of reasons. We are blessed with an opportunity to have spiritual job, rest, all those things. But in addition to that, the Sabbath gives us a chance to reflect. Did this week really go the way that not I wanted, but that God wanted? And what am I going to do about it? 
I do not want the Lord to think of me as a mission impossible. I want God to say, absolutely, is on the same message with me, on the same place, on the same plane. God has come into my life and made a difference. So much so that other people are asking, how is it you have this peace when they say there is no peace? And you can say, because Jesus is in my life. This is, in all these things we're going to be singing in a moment, this is my Father's world. No matter what the enemy may claim, this is God's world, and I am even now a citizen of heaven, but I'm living on earth as an ambassador to bring other people to Christ. And so all of us every day get a chance to make a decision. And sometimes that's the challenging thing because, you know, when you're a, when you're a member of the impossible missions force, fancy word for a spy. You're always a spy. But God gives you the chance to walk away. And unfortunately, there are stories in the Bible of people that did. And I pray that no matter what happens in this world with the chaos, that it draws us closer to God, because there's no other place to be than as close to God as possible. There is nothing on this earth worth losing your salvation for. So John sees four angels on the four corners of the earth, and if we were to go on just a little bit, Verse 4 says that he heard the number of those who were sealed, and it was 144,000, um, 12 of each, 12,000 of each of the tribes of Israel. And there's a lot of back and forth as to what exactly that is. But I would like to share just one little thing with you for your consideration. As you know, there were 12 tribes of Israel. And of these 12, from verses 5 through 8, there's a tribe missing, Dan. There's another tribe missing, Ephraim. And there's somebody who shouldn't be here on the list, yet he is, and that's in verse 8, Joseph, because his inheritance was split to give to his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So if we are thinking that this is literal Israel, you might want to look again and say, maybe God has a place for me amongst the 144,000 who will see it through from the very beginning of trouble all the way to Jesus' second coming. Because after that talks about the, the, the multitude that no one can number of every, focus on every, nation, tribe, people. So matter, no matter who you might think is the so-called enemy, there's someone of that nation, tribe, tongue, people who will be in heaven. Our battle is against the person, the angel, who was the murderer from the beginning, still trying to deceive. So this is your and my possible mission, is to let Jesus Christ live in us through us, 
and not just despite us, that we may grow together as a church family to make such a difference in this community, such a difference in each other's lives that Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit on this church even more than what he has. This is God's world, God's plan, God's mission, God's place. And this is God's world. And he needs people who will demonstrate that on a consistent basis so that he can come back and take us home. Should we stand for prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you that nothing is impossible to you, that you can use human beings who fail more than not, who don't know which way to go most of the time, and you can use us to make a difference for someone else, to draw someone else closer to you. We pray, Lord, that our past will not be our present, that we can leave all of that behind and just take new steps with you, that you will forgive us for the things in the past. We know you took those things to the cross so we wouldn't have to bear them. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we just pray that you will live through us as never before, that you will allow your light to shine through us so others may see our actions and know that it is you and it is calling to them also. We thank you for your grace and your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.